Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mariela Salinas, and I am a digital marketing specialist here at United Training. Welcome to today's webinar, Five Tips in 20 Minutes and User Security, presented by Ken Crawshaw. We are using GoToWebinar's platform today for today's session, and we will be sharing a copy of this recording with you after the webinar. We do encourage participation throughout the webinar, so please use that questions option in your GoToWebinar dashboard. United Training is excited to present this webinar today. I will now hand it over to you, Ken. Thank you. I appreciate it. Hi everyone, my name is Ken Crawshaw and I'm a Senior Principal Technical Instructor for United Training. Um, I've been in the IT industry for quite some time since I graduated from Butler University back in 1990. Um, I've got certifications from a lot of different um, organizations, um, but I am a Master of Science in Information Security and Assurance. I do specialize in mainly high-end security classes. Um, so things like um, Certified Ethical Hacker, Forensics Investigation, uh, CISSP. So there's you know, a wide variety of different classes that I do teach. Um, for this particular seminar, we're going to be taking a look at five tips in 20 minutes for end user security. Um, and so for today, uh, we've got a very short agenda that we're going to be going through. The agenda starts with why do we need end user training? So we'll discuss that topic for a few moments. And the heart and soul, the meat and potatoes, we'll talk about my five tips for end user security. Um, these aren't necessarily the only things that we want end users to do, but these are very easy things that we can ask our end users to do in order to keep our network secure. And then finally, I'll open up the floor for some questions that you may have. And so for the, uh, for the information um, that we discuss, um, like we had mentioned at the very end, please save your questions till the end um, of the presentation. I'll be more than happy to go through anything that you would like to discuss. For our first part, why do we need end user training? Well, there's a couple different reasons. One of the main reasons is most security breaches are a result of internal attacks. In other words, you've got your employees that are authorized to be in the building. They authenticate, they have a good username, they have a good password. You give them the permissions to gain access to resources. And hopefully you've done your job sensitivity profiling, limiting what they have access to, the level of access that they have. But unfortunately, even with permissions, they can still do things that you don't normally expect. For instance, even if you give someone the ability to read, they can still copy, they can still print, they can still forward things on. So whether or not the breach that you may encounter in your organization is intentional, where someone is just disgruntled and purposely takes advantage of the level of access that you've given to them, and potentially steals information or deletes information, or just due to lack of proper training, um, bad things can happen. Um, I've been in a situation where I've seen someone create a query for a database and accidentally overwrite the original data in the database because they weren't properly trained on how to do their job. Another reason why we want to do the training a lot of times is regulatory compliance. Depending on the type of industry that you're in, you may be required to provide training to your end users in order to show that you have done your due diligence. The more information that you give your end users on how to do their jobs, the more likely they're going to be able to do their jobs in a secure way. And if you can show due diligence, as an organization, you can reduce the fines that you may acquire. <laughs> I don't know if acquire is a good word for that, but you might incur if there is a breach. Now for HIPAA, if there is a breach, you can be fined up to one and a half million dollars per incident. Most companies would rather spend a little bit of money on training than pay one and a half million dollars for an incident. 
you'll greatly reduce your fines. I'm not saying what you know, to what level you reduce it, but depending on the type of incident, you could dramatically reduce the amount of loss. Now, as far as my five tips, tip number five, we begin with do not install attachments from unsolicited emails. There's a lot of emails that come in throughout the day. A lot of it is spam. And unfortunately, when you click on the attachments, when you install anything, they talk about you know, some of the emails that I've seen in the past include emails from what appears to be a legit company, but it's a spoofed email. It may look like it's coming from Microsoft and they might tell you, hey, let's go ahead and install this patch in order to take care of a specific vulnerability. Companies like Microsoft do not ever send you emails with attachments to fix problems. You may get a notification of an issue and then you are asked to go out to the official website to download, to test, and then install patches. Another email that I've received not too long ago, and especially with the pandemic going on, we know a lot of people are buying things online and whether or not they're using work emails, it's very possible that people during lunch are going out and shopping online. But I received an email saying, hey, your package has been shipped. Here to track your package, please install this you know, application. To someone that is not properly trained and with the fact that a lot of people are shopping online recently, especially because of the pandemic, you are seeing a lot of people losing track of what they ordered, when they ordered it, from where they ordered. Oh, the, a package? Okay, let me track where it's at. And in theory, we've as administrators, I've limited someone's ability to install third-party applications on a computer, but if an end user happens to be a, a member of the local administrators group, this could be a very easy way for a hacker to install a virus on someone's computer. So just make sure that you're not installing attachments from unsolicited emails. Tip number four, do not just close your browser after visiting a website. In a lot of situations, we are asked to authenticate to gain access to a website. What happens is a lot of companies, a lot of organizations will save what's called a cookie on the local computer. That cookie could have your session information inside of it. When we talk about your session information, what can wind up happening is when you close the web browser without logging out properly, what will happen is your session ID still remains active. You only have to sign in one time to a website, and then you receive information on the local computer that's stored on the computer. So when you go back to the site and go to perform a task, it will go ahead and hopefully. Um, ask you to authenticate again. But if you just close the browser, it'll just say, hey, welcome back, Ken. And that's not a good thing. You need to log out of the site that you provide credentials to in order to make sure the session ID is no longer valid. Now, another thing I want you to think about when it comes to you know, closing your browser and going out to, and visiting different websites, Unfortunately, a lot of people will use the same username and the same password for everything that they do, whether it's for um, paying their credit card, paying you know, their utility bills, going out to a specific uh, company where you can buy clothes, you can buy you know, any kind of goods and services. Everyone uses the same usernames and passwords. So ideally, I also want you to use different usernames and passwords for every site. So that's just kind of an added bonus um, when it comes to visiting websites. When we talk about tip number three, tip number three is do not ever 
use the remember me features. You know the feature where, hey, do you want to remember me for future you know, use? So that way I don't have to retype my username. Now, what's interesting is with some web browsers, not only do they allow you to remember the username, but some web browsers also remember your password. And so that's got to be stored somewhere. And where does it get stored at? On the local computer. So when that information gets stored on that local computer, if I were a hacker, and like I said, I teach a lot of different classes. I teach classes like certified ethical hacking. Um, I show things from a hacker's perspective, how they can gain access to resources. There's information that is very easily accessible on your computer, whether it's kept in the registry of the computer, or whether it's specific files within the hierarchy, within you know, the structure of the computer. There's information, files that have, that store your username and password. There are those people that like to store information about their credit card. So that way I can go ahead and reuse the credit card again. I don't have to retype all the information, trying to remember the long string of numbers and the expiration date and the security code. Let's just fill all that information in. Well, when you use the remember me feature, a lot of times the information is not being stored by the company that you are doing your business with. A lot of times the information is stored in cookies on your local computer. Those cookies, those text files basically, can be easily you know, accessed by a hacker as well. Now, also think about when you sign into a computer, you may be in a work environment, you may be you know, at home, you know, pandemic. You step away from that computer. Someone sits down at your computer, opens up the web browser and happens to go to a site that you've used the Remember Me feature on. They are now acting as you. And from a forensic standpoint, it is still your account your information that was used, you are still accountable for the actions of other people, even though you weren't the one that went to that website, but you had signed in on the computer and you gave them the opportunity to go out to a website and use the remember me features that where you've stored your username and password and potentially credit card information. So you gotta be real careful with that. Tip number two, do not click on links inside of emails or text messages or phone back you know, to a telephone number from a text message. Now, this is a slight variation. You know, earlier in one of the other tips, I said, don't install attachments. But when we talk about the links inside of emails, it may say in the email, your PayPal account may have been compromised. You click on the link and you may be redirected to the hacker's version of that site. And when you're redirected to a hacker's version of a site, whether it's PayPal, whether it is you know, Amazon, whatever you know, website it is, you're asked to sign in to provide your credentials. By clicking on that email link and you're going out to their version of the site, you better believe that they're going to be collecting that end user's username and password, which is most likely going to be the same username and password used for their work environment. And it doesn't take me very much time to go back in based on a person who I've sent an email to, I see that they've hit the link, they've replied, to go back into a social media site, to go back into Google and search and find out what company people work for and know whether or not I can use that username or try to use that username at their company website. 
Now, when I talk about the text messages and links within the text messages, it's the same thing in regards to being redirected to fake sites. But when you're told, hey, your credit card may have been compromised, call this toll-free number. Don't forget, when you call, they're asking, hey, who are you? Please identify yourself. Well, my name is Ken Crawshaw. Your credit card number? Okay, here's my account number. Here's my credit card number. The expiration date? The security code on the back? Your mother's maiden name? Your The street you grew up on? Your first pet's name? Don't call back the number on the text. On the back of your card, you have the telephone number to call. Call it. Because don't forget, if I can trick you into calling a telephone number, I can collect all of the information that is needed to authenticate as you or to reset your password. Because remember, there are certain security questions that are always asked. So not only does this apply to protecting your own credit card information, but this also applies to protecting your work account. Because the questions that get asked, if you ever need to reset your password, what was the first street you grew up on? What was your first pet's name? What is your mother's maiden name? Those are the questions that they're asking for you to identify yourself when you call the telephone number. My last tip, tip number one, do not throw documents in the trash without shredding. And here's why, especially in a work environment. There's a lot of different types of information that you need to protect. Due to regulatory compliance, due to the type of environment that you work in, there may be personally identifiable information. PII is personally identifiable information. You've got financial information. You've got protected healthcare information. You may or may not in your organization have to deal with different regulatory compliance, whether it is HIPAA for, fun, you know, for medical information, Bramley-Bliley for financial information, Sarbanes-Oxley, PCI DSS, payment card industry, data security standards. There's a lot of different types of information that you keep about your customers. And for some reason, a lot of people feel a need to print a document in order to read it. They just feel more comfortable holding something, something tangible. And a lot of end users are guilty of this, where they'll print it so they can read it, they'll you know, go through, they'll do any kind of proofreading crumple it up, throw it away. Once it's in the garbage, once it's in the dumpster, it's fair game. You hear the term dumpster diving that can happen. And don't forget, even if it's not customer information, with some of the IT requirements that you know, different departments have, I must have a password that's 12 characters, upper, lower case, alphanumeric with symbols. How the heck am I supposed to remember that? So I'm going to write it down and I doodle around it. And eventually I have to change passwords. I can throw that paper away. Well, there's a lot of other information that you write down besides passwords, other confidential information that if you just throw it away could lead to a compromise of information for your company. So once again, my tips, do not install attachments from unsolicited emails. Do not just close the web browser after visiting a website. Do not ever, ever, ever use the Remember Me feature. Don't click on links in emails or call back telephone numbers from text messages. Go out to the site that you know, the path that you know, the URL that you already have. Just like calling telephone numbers. And don't throw away documents without having properly shredded the documents. Now, the reason why I chose all five of these security tips is because they all have one thing in common. And that one thing is they take advantage of 
tricking people into doing things they shouldn't do. Social engineering. Social engineering is one of the easiest ways for a hacker to gain access to an organization. Social engineering has become about 75% of an average hacker's toolkit and for the most successful hackers, it reaches 90% or more. And that's you know, a quote from John you know, McAfee. But social engineering is one of the easiest ways for someone to get into a company's information. And it's our duty as IT professionals to make sure that our end users are trained on how to prevent those things from happening. Any questions? All righty, I'll give our chat a little bit more info. Oh. We, it seems we have a little question here from Karen. Um, she missed a few things. Can you put tip number five back on the screen? What is customer PI? Thank you. Let me go backwards here. Okay, when we talk about PII, PII, whoop, there we go. Personally identifiable information. That can be a person's name, social security number, it could be their driver's license information, anything that, that can uniquely identify a person is personally identifiable information. Anything that can uniquely identify someone, that is PII. Awesome, we have one more question. Oh, we have a couple coming in, one from Loretta here. What about your home computer? Is that safe to use to remember me? I still would not just for the simple reason um, a lot of people will use the home computer for a lot of different reasons even you know with social networking if you can honestly say at one point or another a friend may have posted a message or a link oh you got to check this out you click on it because someone has a a favorite video that they post it and you go to watch the music video. I'm guilty of this. I will watch some of my friends' favorite videos. What if going out to that site infects your computer? And now, based on the type of virus or malware, as it's called, malicious software, now someone has access to resources on your computer, including information that's been stored on your machine. I personally, would never use the Remember Me feature. Awesome. We have another question here from Brittany. Do any of these tips change when working remotely or from a home office? Um, these are pretty much universal, whether you are at home or whether you are at the office. These are great tips for both situations. Um, you can, Think about all the things that you do even from home and all the emails that you get. You know, just if I look at my phone right now, um, as I unlock it, I've got, as I'm unlocking, I have a long passcode to unlock my phone because I don't trust anybody. I'm, I'm paranoid that way. Um, I've got 12 emails since one o'clock and only two of them are legit emails. And of the emails that I have, four of them have attachments. We get duped a lot of times into opening up files that we shouldn't open up. There's, there's a special kind of um, attachment where they use what's called and this is, it's called the hidden file extension attack where I receive an email, and this is one that happened a long time ago. Um, you may remember the tennis player, Anna Kornikova, and how everyone was just, oh, Anna Kornikova this, Anna Kornikova that. You receive an attachment that looks like it's a picture because it's labeled Anna Kornikova .jpg. But in a lot of organizations, and even at home, 
there's a thing where we hide the known file extension. And so if it's a Word document, you just see the word, the name of the file, Ken. We don't see that .doc. Well, they're doing the same thing where it's a Visual Basic script to attack a computer. But because we're hiding the file extension, all I saw was anacornikova.jpg, jpg for a picture, .vbs, the Visual Basic script, was hidden. And so the same kind of an attack can happen at the office, the same kind of attack can, can happen at home on your computers. And now with the pandemic, think about the percentage of people that are working from home using their personal computers to remotely connect back to their office. And unknowingly, people are using computers that have been compromised, that have been hacked, to gain access to work-related material. And so whether it's a you know, while you're sitting at the office or whether you're sitting at home, all of these tips are really important. Awesome, great question. Um, we have another question here from Liz, uh, actually from Alana. If I need to open files or attachments from an untrustworthy sender, what is the best way to do this? Do I use a sandbox? There, there are different things you can do. A lot of times, antivirus and anti-malware can be used to scan the email as it comes in. So that's definitely a huge tip. You know, make sure that you have antivirus, anti-malware to pre-scan. A lot of times um, as you go to open up a file, they can't, you can have it set up to scan those items. Now, for those that may not be familiar with the sandbox environment, you can um, set up what we call a virtual machine. And a virtual machine, you can have a separate operating system set up where you don't allow the computer to communicate back to your main computer or any other computer in your network. So when you open up a file, if it is a virus, it doesn't infect any of your work-related information. So being able to use a virtual environment to test anything that you install, whether it's patches, fixes for your computer, your IT department would normally test everything in a sandbox environment before ever introducing any kind of new antivirus definition file, um, any kind of you know application program before installing it in the network, you always test it in a sandbox environment. But for a an attachment, a like a Word document, um, a lot of antivirus, anti-malware programs can scan it before you open it up. Good questions. Great questions, guys. Um, we have one here from Liz. If you click on a link in an email and don't put any information in, is it still if, is your computer still at risk? Back in the day, in order to get a virus, we used to have to double click on an attachment. What we thought was a Word document, if you double click on it and open it up, oh, we could infect our computer. Unfortunately, the sophistication um, that hackers have has changed quite a bit over the years. Now, just going to a website could potentially infect our computers. So by clicking on a link, it could actually allow a virus to be downloaded onto our computer just by going out to a, a bad website. So yeah, just even if you don't type anything in, going out to a website can still infect your computer, unfortunately. Unfortunately, and I, I think we about have one more minute for questions, guys, so I'm so sorry if we don't get to all of them. We will be following up with you at, after the webinar in case any of your questions don't get asked, but um, here's one more question right here um, from Marla. Do we make this a mandatory training for our employees? When we talk about training for employees, one of the biggest factors as to whether or not it's mandatory is what kind of industry are you in? 
as I was talking about before with regulatory requirements, if you have to deal with HIPAA, if you have to deal with Sarbanes-Oxley, SOX as it's sometimes called, um, a lot of regulatory compliance deals with making sure that you've trained your end users on how to do their job in a secure way. If you don't train your employees and there's a breach, then you could face some very hefty fines within the organization. And so the training is extremely important from the, from the aspect of not only avoiding fines, but think about your customers and the confidence that, you that they have in you and your reputation you want to make sure that your employees are doing things in a safe, secure manner, because it is your company's reputation on the line when there is a breach. Um, and one other suggestion I have in regards to training, regulatory compliance requires everyone to be trained every single year. The worst thing you can do is use the same training every single year, because I'll, I'll tell you, I've been with my company for over 20 years. My anniversary date was September 4th of this year. And if I have to go through the same training 20 times, you better believe that I'm on my phone. Uh, what? Huh? Is it break? Are we done? Is it break time yet? The, a lot of people feel they know everything. And unfortunately, people get lax in what they do, how they do it. And so, Updating the training, understanding that new employees need to go through the full training. People that have been with the organization for a while, you can look at help desk tickets. You can look at um, information that shows the trends, problems that you're having, and focus the training on where you want to improve security. And remember, different people have different job responsibilities. I'm not going to have the CXOs learn secure ways of typing information into the database. They've got different expectations in regards to security as compared to someone that is more of a data entry person. Different job roles, different types of situations that they may encounter that we need to train them on. So different types of training for different people and change the training up so that way they don't ignore you when they come in for the fifth, the sixth, the seventh year in a row. Amazing. Great questions, guys. I really appreciate you guys using that, that dashboard. Um, thank you so much, Ken. This was a lot of amazing information. Uh, again, we will be sharing this recording with you all in an email after the webinar. If you have any questions uh, that need a little bit more answering or you want to look into some security training, please let us know. Um, we would love to get you that information and um, keep your, your organization safe. So again, thank you all so much. Thank you, Ken. Um, enjoy and I, do want to, day. I do oh. want to say one thing real quick. Um, as far as offering training and the question came up, do we need to train employees? Um, there are different vendors that offer two day, one day, two hour classes based on your needs. And so make sure that you talk to your account executives through um, your through United Training um, and they can definitely make recommendations as to what might work best for your situation. So there are a lot of different options out there for training for your employees. 100%. So again, if you guys need any of that information, we got it for you. So um, thanks again, everybody. Please let us know if you need anything and um, enjoy the rest of your day. Take care, everyone. Take care.